from the National Catholic Register. This is Register Radio, bringing light and clarity to the news and topics that affect your life. As Advent draws to a close and we prepare for the Christmas season, it's always helpful to ponder some of the great traditions with the small t the Catholics love to celebrate. One of them is a much-asked question. Who really was St. Nicholas? And how did he become today's Santa Claus? This week on Register Radio, we talked to Register contributor Thomas Crowell about the life and legacy of St. Nicholas and whatever happened to devotion to this great saint. I'm Matthew Bunsen, a senior editor for the National Catholic Register, senior contributor for EWTN, and co-host of Register Radio. Thanks again so much for joining me. Well, my first guest recently wrote, For nearly 1,700 years, St. Nicholas has been one of the most popular saints of the Church in the East and the West. The number of churches, chapels, religious institutions, and altars dedicated to him throughout the Christian world defy counting. According to the new edition of Butler's Lives of the Saints, about 400 churches are dedicated to him in England alone. But then he asks, how did he go into such a devotional tailspin? Well, Thomas Crowell is the author of more than 40 books, including Saints Behaving Badly, This Saint Will Change Your Life, Stealing Lincoln's Body, and Thomas Jefferson's Creme Brulee, how a founding father and his slave, James Hemings, introduced French cuisine to America. Well, Thomas, welcome uh, to Register Radio. Thank you, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be with you. Merry Christmas. Same to you. Well, as, as I uh, said to you when we started talking offline, that uh, it's, it's a, a lot of fun for me because I love reading your historical pieces for the Register. Oh, so first, thank you for all of those. My pleasure. I like the offbeat. Yes, well, you managed that really well. <laughs> and uh, our topic today, though, is St. Nicholas. And, and in your piece, you note that uh, St. Nicholas has been obviously immensely popular, but we also now see this sort of trail off in devotion to him. For yeah. people who are still always confused about this sort of thing, who exactly was he? Um, St. Nicholas uh, grew up in a Christian family in what's now Turkey. And uh, tw this was towards the end of the great persecution of the Church. Uh, he went through the usual uh, formation, you know, deacon, priest, and then was, de was named uh, Bishop of Myra. Uh, the Greeks have a tradition that he was at the Council of Nicaea, um, to, um, which of course condemned Arius and the Arian heresy. Um, he doesn't, alas, he doesn't appear on the oldest list, but, you know, Paperwork does get messed up, and the, the Greeks have this wonderful story, which is probably not true, but I love it anyway, that when Arius stood up and told all of the Orthodox bishops that um, Christ was not the second person of the Blessed Trinity, but a supernatural superman, um, Nicholas got up, walked across the room, and slapped him across the face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Nicholas had an edge. Well, I saw uh, just a few days ago that there was a, a recreation of what they think Nicholas might have looked like. Uh, so oh, really? It, yeah, for those who uh, want it, you can find that online. I thought it was an interesting shot, especially because uh, supposedly the nose was broken. So I don't know how that happened in history. But uh, huh. <laughs> St. Nicholas, though, uh, has this romantic connotation to him and, and somehow became attached uh, to Christmas and other things. And, and how yeah. did that happen exactly? Well, actually, um, in the early half, the first half of the, of the 19th century in America, um, Christmas was kind of a rough-and-tumble holiday, a lot, of, uh, a lot of heavy drinking, um, not in the home, in, in the taverns where it mm -hmm. belongs, a lot of uh, raucous behavior out in the streets, and Washington Irving, America's first really best-selling author, the guy who gave us the legend of Sleepy Hollow and the legend of Rip Van Winkle, that, you know, Christmas really should be calmed down. And so he started promoting it as a family holiday, a day when friends would call on each other, uh, gifts were exchanged, sing carols around the piano, that type of thing. And it wasn't a bad idea because during the bad old days of Christmas in America, one Christmas Eve, a, a bunch of uh, drunken Scots Protestants tried to burn down Manhattan's only Catholic <laughs> church with the congregation inside, and among them was, was St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, among um, Irving's supporters was um, Mr. Professor Clement Clark Moore, who gave us uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas. And he used St. Nicholas interchangeably with Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the poem has been 
popular for, uh, what, 170, 180 years? Right. I mean, it's really passed into the public consciousness probably like no other children's poem. And my suggestion is that even among the most devout Catholics, it's hard to pray to a saint who's described as a right jolly old elf. <laughs> Uh, so agreed, I think yeah. That's when I think the the poem really started to undermine Nicholas's reputation in the West. Um, in the East, it's an entirely different thing because the East had no comparable "Twas the Night Before Christmas." So Nicholas's reputation as, as a man of great sanctity and great charity is intact there, and um, here he's kind of an afterthought. Mm-hmm. Well, you're listening to Register Radio here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Matthew Bunsen, talking with uh, Registry contributor Thomas Crowell about uh, St. Nicholas, a perfect person to talk about for this time of year. And uh, Thomas, though, there's a story, of course, about St. Nicholas uh, that tells of his compassion for young women uh, who yes. were trying to get married. So right. it sort of fits with what eventually became of his reputation as on this jolly old St. Nick. Yeah, I mean, this is probably um, the, the legend that inspired the idea of St. Nicholas bringing gifts, Santa Claus bringing gifts. Um, and the story goes that uh, there was um, a one-time well-to-do gentleman who lost his fortune, and he had absolutely no money for his daughter's dowries. And without a dowry, they were unlikely to make any kind of marriage at all. This is, we're talking about the 300s now. Um, and he feared that to support themselves, they might actually have to go into a life of prostitution, which is unthinkable for any father. And Nicholas heard about this. And so for three nights running, he walked past the house and he threw in a bag of gold to an open window. And so in three nights, the do- each daughter had enough for a dowry, and on the third night, you know, by this time they had figured out somebody's outside, and <laughs> when the bag landed, uh, the entire family came running out to see who their benefactor was, and, and it was Nicholas. And mm-hmm. in art, he's usually shown holding three gold balls instead of three bags of gold, and uh, pawnbrokers adopted him as their patron saint. Lots of people did. Um, and so that's why you see three gold balls hanging over a pawnbroker's shop in honor of St. Nicholas. Well, yeah, that's, that I did not actually know myself, so uh, I appreciate the, uh, the insight. That, that is really very interesting. But now there's even the contested story of um, his remains, because uh, yep. talk about that. Well, um, Nicholas was buried in his cathedral in Mira in, in Turkey, and when um, the Turks started making incursions into the Byzantine Empire, the, the empire in the east, um, at one point they conquered the city of Mira, and Christians in the west were worried that the Turks would desecrate the tomb of St. Nicholas. And the Venetians launched a bunch of ships to go save the relics, and the people of Bari, who were much closer, got there first. So they took the relics and um, erected this fantastic Romanesque cathedral or basilica in their city and buried the bones of St. Nicholas in the crypt. And they're still there. Mm -hmm. Um, The shrine draws both um, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox Christians. And um, not that long ago, one of the Orthodox Christians who came was Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So... Well, let's let's hope that uh, some of the praying there had had a good effect on him. Uh, it, 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 there's nowhere to go but up. <laughs> exactly. Well, in the spirit of Christmas and, and in the, the time that we have left, I really wanted to talk to you also about another great piece that you wrote for the Register, and that was on the unexpected 1914 Christmas ceasefire. Yeah. What was that all about? Well, nobody exactly knows how this. We could see how it would start in one isolated part of the line, but it went up and down the British line. Um, you know, it, remember, World War One was the war of trench warfare. Mm-hmm. So the British and the Germans were, in some places, barely 100 feet away from one another, 100 yards. And one Christmas Eve, 1914, the first year of the war, uh, the English hear the Germans on the other side of no man's land singing, 
still a nacht, silent night. Mm-hmm. And they peer up over the edge of the trench, and they see candlelight. And so when the Germans finished still a nacht, the English sang Joy to the World. And then somebody in the, Brit- in the English, tr- or excuse me, in the German trenches knew a little English, and he yelled, don't shoot, we'll bring beer. <laughs> and so the uh, troops met in the middle of, of no man's land and swapped chocolates and beer and sausage and cigarettes. And it started this, this Christmas truce. Nobody would fire at each other. Um, and it, as I say, it spread up and down um, the British and German lines at this point. This was in Flanders, northern Belgium. Uh, no, and as I say, no one really knows how it spread. But uh, they extended it throughout Christmas Day. Um, in some places, it lasted until New Year's Day. And the, um, the British officer corps especially was outraged mm-hmm. and were issuing all kinds of commands that this was not to be done, return to your trenches, shoot at the enemy. Um, and uh, it was damn near universally ignored. And uh, there's one, one story that at one point of the line, um, the British challenged a Saxon regiment to a soccer game, and the Saxons won on Christmas Day 3-2. to two. <laughs> Yeah. And you wonder uh, if uh, somehow that uh, Christmas ceasefire had held how different uh, European history might have been. Yeah, you know, um, it, it doesn't get repeated on that scale if it was ever repeated on any scale in subsequent wars. And I, I suspect it's because after World War I, trench warfare, you know, the commanders realized this is not the way to go. Mm-hmm. And so the, you know, wasn't, the enemies were not in close proximity to one another. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they would shout things back and forth to each other and from time to time you know, lob over some spontaneous gift like mm-hmm. a newspaper wrapped around a rock. Exactly. Um, one occasion the Germans sent over a, a boot stuffed <laughs> with German chocolates and, and German sausage. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately. Well, but, uh, you know, we'll talk uh, some more. <laughs> we will, definitely. Uh, Thanks so much uh, for joining me, and I know that there's uh, you have a lot of things in the works, so I'm looking forward to having you back.